Dell Brain and Mind seminar series. Um, it's really wonderful uh, today. We have Anna Dorty uh, joining us. Um, okay. it, so um, I guess uh, now's a good time to set up a reminder for um, everyone to please mute their microphones and turn off their cameras um, for the duration of this talk. If you have any questions, please, um, please write them to me in the chat box um, for during the talk. And if it's a, a matter of clarity, I will um, request that Anna um, answer the question. However, um, please hold your questions to the end. Um, and we're looking forward to having a good duration of time for discussion. So, um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of things here that we are keen to talk about. So please stick around for that Q&A, uh, which will be mediated through the chat window. All right, so as I mentioned today, we have Anna Dorty joining us. Um, she completed her, her PhD in psychology at Wayne State University under the supervision of Naftali Raz. She then went on to the Beckman Postdoctoral Research Fellowship um, at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, where her faculty mentors were Art Kramer and Neil Cohen. She then began her assistant professorship back again at Wayne State University in Detroit um, in the Department of Psychology, where she's currently an assistant professor um, conducting research in what I think is a really fascinating area, and it's one that I've been following for a number of years now. Um, and Anna really is one of the world leaders in this area, and that's really examining the lifespan accumulation of subcortical iron, which has very substantial implications for aging as well as cognitive health. So I'm looking forward to your talk today, Anna, um, on brain iron as a biomarker of impending cognitive decline. So thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to um, chatting with you more later. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate the kind introduction and many thanks to all of you for your attendance today and the invitation to speak. Um, let's see if we can get started. Here are two plots of longitudinal change in the hippocampus and the interrenal cortex. And as you can see, individuals differ in the pace and magnitude of change. And by ca uh, characterizing the pattern and sources of individual differences, we can gain insight into the relationship between brain structure and function, as well as mechanisms of their decline. This is the intent behind my research program that studies vascular and metabolic health factors that shape changes in brain structure and function across the life course with the goal to create opportunities for early detection of cognitive decline or risk thereof and possible interventions to promote cognitive maintenance. Today I'll be talking about a line of my research that focuses on uh, brain iron accumulation as a possible pathway for risk for cognitive decline, as well as the use of MRI measures as a possible biomarker to detect early life risk. So to get us started, let me explain that there are two functional forms of biological iron. The first is heme iron, which is a component of hemoglobin. It binds oxygen and delivers it throughout the body. Today, I'll be focusing on the other form, non-heme iron or not in blood. And here's a cartoon schematic of how non-heme iron acts within a healthy uh, neuron. Um, throughout the course of a life of a cell, iron is important for basic functions like mitochondrial um, metabolism, DNA replication, ATP synthesis, and in the brain, neurotransmission and myelinating processes. So iron is necessary for the basic energy currency and um, neural substrates of communication in the brain. In the course of aging, non-heme iron appears to accumulate outside of binding complexes and the accumulation of iron outside of its regulation uh, promotes a large amount of free radical production and when accumulated this constitutes what's called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress in turn causes several downstream effects like um, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine expression, DNA mutations, and apoptosis. Now, free radical production is a normal part of metabolism, and when it's correctly um, managed, it's, it's an important part of the normal metabolic function and pathways. But in the course of aging, what seems to happen is an unbridled 
amount of oxidative stress that appears to be driven mostly by the accumulation of non-heme iron outside of binding complexes. We can start to articulate this mechanism in a broader understanding of um, microstructural changes that may drive cumulative changes to brain structure and function. And that oxidative stress um, selectively targets mitochondrial function early on in the um, cascade. And this basic energy deficit then leads to disrupted neurotransmission and disrupted maintenance of the cell, ultimately leading to apoptosis and atrophy. And together, this constitutes global changes in brain structure, brain structure as well as a disrupted neural function, and then ultimately deficits in cognitive function and behavior. Now you'll see that the mitochondria directly manage uh, iron homeostasis and disrupted mitochondria will upregulate uh, the uh, transport of iron and um, the freeing of iron within the cell, creating higher concentrations. And so this starts to become a cycle that becomes, is self-propagating. And as the cell degrades, iron accumulation will continually increase and increase the oxidative stress, ultimately driving like an engine, this cumulative and progressive aging process. Now this is a model of aging and this cartoon schematic is somewhat of a simplification, but I'm gonna use it as an anchor throughout this talk to try to um, summarize some of the applications of my research and understanding not only mechanisms of neural and cognitive decline, but also the potential of using um, this knowledge to create biomarkers for early intervention. So uh, the understanding that oxidative stress, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and then ultimately apoptosis and, and other uh, deleterious mechanisms might contribute to microstructural changes is a well understood and, and accepted um, theories of aging. What is unique here though is that oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction are relatively difficult to characterize in living brains, but iron accumulation can be estimated in vivo using MRI methods. And so we have an opportunity here to peek in on a mechanism that is otherwise very difficult to study in living brains and increase opportunities for longitudinal study as well as tracking cognitive declines. Now there's a few different methods uh, for measuring or estimating iron concentration in the brain using MRI. Today I'll be mostly talking about data that is R2 star relaxometry. Here I'm showing you uh, four slices of a brain. This is a 57 year old female. It's a T2 star weighted image. On these images, uh, darker intensity indicates more iron concentration or higher magnetic susceptibility. And so you can see it here in the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, the red nucleus in substantia nigra, as well as the globus pallidus caudate putamen. Now, across the entire lifespan, the basal ganglia structures, particularly the globus pallidus, has the highest iron concentration. Uh, and you can see that here just with the naked eye. If we inverse the signal, make what is dark light. It is instead an R2 star weighting. And so you'll see uh, most of my data is labeled as R2 star so that higher values indicate more iron. One of the promises of this technique is now that we can measure and quantify iron concentration throughout the brain and in living individuals and ask strategic questions about uh, are there changes with aging and do those changes track with the development of neuropathology and cognitive decline? So here's an example. This is uh, some of my data. It's a cross-sectional plot just illustrating age-related differences in striatal iron content as estimated from R2 star. Again, higher values indicate more iron. And you can see there's a strong positive correlation. Now, of course, you should be immediately suspicious and point out that this is a cross-sectional study. And so what was really needed to understand the potential of iron concentration as marking as participating in a mechanism of decline but also as a biomarker we had to have longitudinal study and so today i'll be re uh, reviewing some of the results from my longitudinal studies this is a snapshot of one sample the samples i'll be showing you are relatively the same characteristics demographically and so in this sample it's a two-year longitudinal study 125 individuals were enrolled at baseline, 78 returned two years later for additional assessments. 
Typically, these samples are uh, adult lifespan. In this case, they were ages 18 to 77 years at baseline. And as you can see, they're of good health. Um, they are screened for dementia with no evidence of dementia by the MMSE, screened for depression symptoms by the CESD, again, no evidence of depression. 16 or higher would indicate depressive symptoms, note as well as within the normal range of many cardiovascular health factors. So this is um, what we might term a successful aging sample, somewhat, uh, a set of individuals who don't have chronic conditions and really what we're uh, observing are the aging processes. One more methodol uh, methodology note here, most of the analyses I'll be presenting today are structural equation models showing latent change or predictors of latent change. Here's one example of a two time point latent change score model in which the boxes represent the actual measures observed. In this case, the left and right striatum um, R2 star intensity as an index of iron. These are then used to identify a latent construct at each time point, and these latent constructs are then uh, nested to create what is called a latent change score. This is conceptually similar to a different score, time two minus time one. But because it's a latent change estimate, it is by definition free of measurement error and provides error-free estimates of individual differences. You'll see um, most of the uh, reported results are accompanied with bias-corrected bootstrap 95% confidence intervals. And uh, the models, here's just a general summary of the model fit, all of which had excellent fit and reproduced in the data. So let's dig into it. Here is the results of a two-year longitudinal study of that healthy aging sample that I just characterized with you. And here on the left, we have, sorry, here on the left, we have um, average R2 star in the caudate nucleus in which higher values indicate more iron. And this is an individual change plot. And so this dot, for example, represents one individual and following the line connecting it is the same individual measured two years later. And the slope of that line is their individual change. Now this individual happened to decrease in iron over the two year window, but you can see that many of these slopes are pointing upwards, indicating overall uh, an increase in iron over two years, and that's evidenced here by a significant mean change. Now concurrent to that, we can also measure volumes, and as you would expect, the volume of the caudate nucleus decreases um, over these two years, and you can see that with these downward slopes to the right. So now we have one question answered. Does iron actually accumulate in living brains? Before uh, the application of these methods to longitudinal study, we could only rely on postmortem uh, histological and histochemical study, which of course we can only then make inferences about correlations with age. So this is the first longitudinal evidence that indeed iron appears to accumulate in structures within otherwise typical healthy aging brains. The next question then is, um, does the correlation of increases in iron correlate with uh, the longitudinal shrinkage of the region. That is, does brain iron accumulation predict structural declines? And it does. Uh, in that same analysis, we can pair up change um, score models and we can ask, does the magnitude or direction of change in iron predict the change in magnitude of shrinkage? And here, um, greater values indicate greater accumulation of iron on the x-axis and on the y-axis, uh, more negative values indicate a greater or steeper rate of decline. And so in the caudate nucleus, more iron accumulation predicted faster shrinkage in these individuals over two years. I then replicated this in a different sample. Um, this was a middle-aged to older adult sample, but what was unique was they were followed four times over a period of seven years, and again replicated the result. Here I'm just showing you the result with, um, within the patamen, in which individuals who entered the study with higher iron experienced greater shrinkage over seven years. And in fact, we could predict um, the, the volume seven years later based off of their baseline iron estimates. Now in these models, we can reverse the direction and we can ask, is it actually iron predicting forward to volume? Or is it that volume is shrinking and, and then we have an artifact of iron increasing? And in these models, we found no evidence of an inverse relation. That is, with the temporal precedence that uh, four time points over seven years allows us, 
we only find evidence of iron predicting forward to volumetric shrinkage over the same time period. So that's the second question now answered. Does brain iron accumulation um, predict structural declines? And it appears it does, at least in the, these samples of otherwise typical aging adults. You should all be asking yourselves the so what question though. Does it matter for cognition? Does brain iron accumulation independently predict cognitive declines? And returning to our two year longitudinal study of that um, uh, adult lifespan cohort, we again find evidence that brain iron accumulation does predict cognitive deficits. Here, greater iron at baseline predicts greater decline in verbal working memory. And this is independent of the changes in volume that I just demonstrated to you. I've since replicated these relationships with different uh, brain regions of interest and different um, cognitive and motor tasks. And in each instance, brain iron and age-related differences in brain iron accumulation appear to predict cognitive and behavioral deficits uh, in a region-specific manner. Greater iron in the globus pallidus predicts deficits in cognitive motor control. Greater accumulation of iron in the caudate specifically uh, predicts declines in working memory function. Greater iron accumulation in the hippocampus specifically uh, predicts deficits in declarative and episodic memory functions as indexed by error. And even in complex cognitive tasks like spatial navigation ability, which we can assess through virtual environments, we can look at the different cognitive processes that go into it, including working memory, including declarative memory and executive control. And again, region specific measures impair specific aspects of this task. And here's just one example that uh, increases in caudate um, iron predict navigation errors. So here now is an answer to a third question. It does appear that brain iron accumulation in, in typical uh, aging and older adults predicts cognitive deficits in a meaningful way. In, in tasks that are vulnerable in aging and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, and in tasks that are relevant for independent living. And here I'd like to take just a moment to reflect on the historical context. In uh, late 1800s, we have our first report of abnormal brain iron concentration in an older brain um, in an individual who died with motor symptoms. It's almost a uh, hundred years later that we have the reports from Halgren and Sarander um, where they're showing lifespan differences from infancy to brains 100 years old and tracking age-related differences in uh, post-mortem iron concentration estimates. Around the same time, we have the introduction of the free radical theory of aging. Now, up until that point, all of that information is based off of post-mortem reports. And it's not until the 1990s and early 2000s that the MRI methods that allow us to estimate uh, iron content in vivo are really established and carefully validated to the point of application. And now here in 2015, I published the first longitudinal report of brain iron accumulation in healthy aging. And then over the subsequent years, we've replicated the effect across multiple samples and showing the promise of brain iron accumulation as estimated by MRI as a biomarker of both volumetric declines and cognitive declines. So in that context, then, we can start to place uh, brain iron within a broader understanding of biomarkers of um, age-related neurodegeneration, as well as the development of pathologies related to aging. And here I'm adapting um, a set of curves that you're probably familiar with, sometimes called the Jack curves. And so as we think about abnormality of biomarkers, we can see that cognitive impairment actually occurs very late in the lifespan after quite a bit has already happened. And individuals at lower risk will show declines later than individuals who have higher risk for cognitive impairment. Now, possibly even years before cognitive impairment is evident, we may be able to see structural declines. Uh, for example, hippocampal volume is a common indicator for uh, pending Alzheimer's disease-related pathologies. Possibly even before structural declines, we may see uh, biomarkers related to Alzheimer's pathology like A-beta de deposition or disruption to functional MRI. Um, either task-based 
uh, task-based signal or resting state. And we could place this on a continuum from normal aging into disease. Based on the reviewed uh, evidence that I've shown you so far, I hypothesize that iron accumulation may actually precede all of these. That based off of the known histochemical properties of non-heme iron, the bioavailability of it, and the management of it in relation to different changes within microstructural systems, iron accumulation as measured by MRI may be a biomarker that allows for early detection. Now, I've already shown you its relation that it precedes structural declines and precedes cognitive impairments. And now I'll show you um, some preliminary evidence that suggests that iron accumulation does appear to at least correlate with two other indicators along the scale. So let's first look at functional MRI. This is a cross-sectional study. It's a fairly large sample across the adult lifespan, and they completed an NBAC working memory task within the scanner. This task was intentionally designed to modulate difficulty. And here is then the heat maps of activation of changes in activation in response to the difficulty modulation of the task, and more specifically, the portions of that activity signal that correlate with age and striatal iron content. And something you can see is that uh, by measuring iron from the striatum, we can actually predict age-related differences in task-based signal within the striatum, as well as in functionally um, correlated regions uh, within the prefrontal cortex and furofrontal gyrus. And this is what that effect looks like, this complex interaction. Individuals who have greater iron accumulation are less able to modulate activation in response to difficulty of the task. This outside of the scanner correlates with deficits on the task. And this interacts with age. The effect is strongest in the youngest and middle-aged adults, and the effect is attenuated in the oldest individuals in the sample. Now, from that broader model that I had uh, started our talk off with, it makes sense that in the course of aging, many things are accumulating in the brain that will cause changes in function as well as in structure. And so the idea that the effect may be attenuated in older adults is probably consistent with a broader model of aging, that there is more to aging than simply iron. But what is intriguing in these results is that even among middle-aged adults, we see a correlation between iron concentration modulating task-based activation in relation to deficits in a task, like uh, a working memory task. Here's another cross-sectional study, uh, a slightly smaller sample, all middle-aged and older adults. What's unique about this sample is that they also underwent uh, PET imaging for whole brain SUVR in order to estimate beta amyloid burden. So in animal models of iron accumulation and, and metabolism, there's some evidence that uh, beta amyloid deposition may actually co-localize with iron homeostasis and abnormal amounts of iron concentration. The, the temporal precedence of these factors is not clear. Um, moreover, it's more likely that both have a correlated cause and just general cellular disruption and poor maintenance of the cell. And, and so what we're probably seeing is co are correlated biomarkers, not necessarily mutual causes. But we can ask that question now in humans. And so to my knowledge, this is the first report in a human sample um, where we examine whole brain uh, amyloid burden with estimates of iron. Here I'm showing it with the striatum. And we find no relationship actually between brain iron accumulation and beta amyloid. So perhaps they are correlated to a common cause, but they don't appear to be correlated to each other here. This is interesting. We can go a step further though, and ask how these two potential biomarkers may predict other neuropathological changes relevant to aging and, and the progression of neurogenic diseases. And for that, I'm going to look at another imaging technique. This is a high-res uh, sequence that allows us to visualize the hippocampal subfields as well as measure the inner rhinal cortex. Now, in the progress of Alzheimer's disease-related pathology, we often emphasize the vulnerability of the hippocampus, but the pathology begins earlier in the perirhinal and inner rhinal cortices and then spreads from the inner rhinal cortex to the subiculum and then from the subiculum out to the rest of the complex. And so 
uh, since the introduction of this high resolution imaging technique in the last seven to 10 years, we've really seen um, increased sensitivity in detecting preclinical decline um, based uh, by looking at these subregions. So in this analysis, we went a step further. Instead of just asking, does iron correlate with amyloid, we asked, does iron interact with amyloid to predict structural vulnerabilities that are typical in aging, as well as are characteristic in Alzheimer's disease. And we find a very complex effect that's a four-way interaction. Now, the effect is specific to the interrhinal cortex. We don't find evidence of this relationship in this sample in any of the subfields of the hippocampus. So I'll be showing you the effect as it presents in the interrhinal cortex. And the moment that you introduce three variables at a time, the plots become a little bit complicated. So I wanna walk through how to read this before I show you the data. On the bottom, x-axis, we have R2 star. Again, higher values indicate more iron. On the y vertical axis, this is the slope of age. That is the slope of the correlation between age and interrenal cortex. And negative values would indicate uh, smaller volumes with age. And then at the top, I'm sorry, and, and those correlations are centered around zero. So a zero is a meaningful indicating there would be no effective age um, or no, no correlation of age with interrenal cortex volume. And then at the top, we have SUVR load. These are just representative values and um, beta amyloid composition was treated as a continuous variable in this analysis. So let's start to look at the data. At low levels of beta amyloid, we see that um, greater iron accumulation very weakly correlates with the relationship between age and interrenal cortex volume. This is effectively a null relationship. But at a moderate amyloid level, we start to see an exacerbation of that effect. And at the highest amyloid levels, which would be indicative of Alzheimer's disease-related pathology, uh, we now see um, a much stronger effect. And what's notable here is that for individuals with a moderate to high beta amyloid concentration in their whole brain, uh, in, we see that a greater brain iron accumulation exacerbates or worsens the age-related differences in neuronal cortex volume. Put another way, for individuals who have high beta amyloid deposition and low iron, we don't see that same deleterious effect. So we're starting to see a complex interaction between two different biomarkers that probably are signaling the disruption of um, cellular maintenance and the uh, early development of pathology that signals future risk for Alzheimer's disease and other related pathologies. Now what's of note is that this is a sample that is cognitive typical. They show no evidence of dementia. Uh, at best, they are just at risk for preclinical decline in the upcoming years. So to summarize where we've been, going back to our cartoon version of the FRIENDS model, I've shown you that brain iron accumulation indeed occurs in typical aging that iron accumulation proceeds and predicts structural declines two to seven years in the future. It predicts cognitive deficits up to two years in a region-specific manner. And in cross-sectional studies, brain iron accumulation disrupts uh, functional MRI signal and modulation to task difficulty, even in middle-aged adults. And it appears to correlate and possibly even exacerbate the effects of beta amyloid as an indicator of cellular pathology. The next question then, after we've started to characterize, does iron accumulation occur and does it act upon known patterns of pathology and aging and related dementia? Um, now that we have that information, the next question is, uh, what else acts upon the system? And what we know is that chronic cardiovascular disease, hypertension, elevation and in indicators of metabolic syndrome all contribute to declines in cerebrovascular health. And because iron homeostasis is directly dependent on endothelial function, it's logical that chronic conditions that disrupt blood supply may in fact act upon iron accumulation and exacerbate this process. A second related pathway is the privileged relationship that iron homeostasis has with inflammation. In a typical uh, healthy cell, um, inflammation is used in an immune response, among other things, and part of the normal immune response is an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and at the same time a mutual increase in free non-heme iron 
and related oxidative stress. They are a mutual and bi-directional relationship. Where there is one, there is the other. And there is a prominent theory termed the inflammaging theory of age um, that suggests that chronic low-grade inflammation may be a driving force in the neurodegenerative process. And so here I'm gonna review some preliminary evidence that articulates a relationship between inflammation and, and systemic cerebrovascular health acting upon iron accumulation, and that possibly iron accumulation acts as a pathway to convey the risk of these factors for broader structural and functional declines. So here is yet another cross-sectional study, but in this case, we have a lifespan cohort that has been characterized for pro-inflammatory cytokine risk, and I'm looking at a genetic SNP for interleukin-1 beta. Interleukin-1 beta is implicated in the typical aging process as well as elevations in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, and carriage of the T allele um, increases risk for uh, chronic expression of interleukin-1 beta, and it follows um, your expected dose dependency where uh, CT heterozygotes have an increased re risk relative to CC homozygotes, but relatively lower risk than TT homozygotes. And here, this is a cross-sectional study, and I'm showing you a path analysis in which genetic predisposition for inflammation moderates the relation between striatal iron content and cognitive switching ability. That is, in the presence of the risky T allele, the consequence of striatal iron content is greater as compared to CC homozygotes. What's of note, though, is that uh, the T um, the genetic predisposition for inflammation does not appear to be moderating the relationship between age and striatal iron. That is, it may not change the trajectory of iron accumulation, but may act upon its effect. And here's a demonstration of what those data look like plotted for the um, trajectories. Now you'll note that in this smaller group of, N20, of 23 individuals that are TT homozygotes, uh, this pathway does not reach significance. It's still a fairly large effect, negative 0.35, but doesn't reach statistical significance. I wanna highlight here that that group is on average younger than the CC homozygote and CT heterozygotes. And this is um, probably very typical selection bias that many of us see in our studies. Individuals with genetic predisposition for inflammation um, are very likely to develop chronic disease conditions later in life that would disqualify them from these studies where we are rigorously screening for health um, at enrollment. And so it's interesting that this effect, although not significant, is is actually equivalent to um, the, the effect in negative 0.43 that we see in CT, suggesting that uh, even among these younger adults, we're already seeing the risk accumulate. And I would uh, speculate that if we followed this group of individuals a few years later, we would probably see this effect hold, if not become worse, um, as related to the risk factor. So, uh, to my knowledge, this is the first report in a human sample illustrating a relation between inflammation or genetic risk for inflammation and uh, age-related differences in iron accumulation and with cognitive consequences. Very briefly, I'll review the relationship between chronic hypertension as just one of many chronic cerebral vascular health factors that I study. In this first plot published by my colleague, um, Karen Rodrigue, uh, this is T2 star, so lower values indicate more iron. And as you can see across multiple regions of interest, including the hippocampus and interonal cortex that are vulnerable in aging and Alzheimer's disease, as well as the cauda impetamen, the striatum regions we've been talking about, um, hypertensives show greater iron concentration as compared to normotensive counterparts. Uh, here are an example of unpublished data um, from my own studies in which uh, even among individuals who are normotensive, people with higher pulse pressure as uh, have higher iron concentration within these regions. So these are examples of subclinical elevations and risk factors that may have effects on a broader system of neurodegeneration um, and iron accumulation may be one pathway for that effect. Now that I've mentioned the importance of cardiovascular health acting upon non-heme iron, uh, homeostasis, it's very reasonable for you to ask, but wait, 
is this actually just heme iron then? At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that there are two forms, heme iron in circulating blood and non-heme iron, which is stored and used within cells. I've been emphasizing the role of non-heme iron in the neurodegenerative system. These scans that we use are also exquisitely sensitive to, for the detection of cerebral microbleeds. Here's an example of a different, of a different scan type called QSM, quantitative susceptibility mapping, but it looks very much the same as what we've been looking at with uh, uh, R2-star. And here, this very bright, hyper-intense dot um, is a cerebral microbleed, and then you can see the magnified image. And uh, what we know from epidemiological and, and longitudinal cohort studies is that cerebral microbleeds um, can occur with traumatic brain injury, and that in individuals without a history of traumatic brain injury, they are extremely rare in the normal population. Uh, here I'm showing you data in a large sample that we followed for eight years with multiple time points. And in the course of eight years, approximately 10% of individuals uh, acquired one asymptomatic cerebral microbleed. So this is consistent with an understanding that they're very, very rare. And we can look at the cumulative risk trajectories. Uh, in this, the squares are younger adults, or excuse me, the squares are older adults. And again, this is that selection bias. If you were uh, eligible for my study when you were 80, you were probably in excellent health. Whereas if you are age 40 at enrollment, you still have quite a bit of lifetime risk ahead of you. And so if you are middle age, you have greater risk than 80 year olds. However, uh, all these dotted lines here are now factoring in subclinical elevation in different cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, uh, elevated blood glucose and other things. Even factoring this in, you still only have about 25% probability of acquiring one microbleed. Now, where a microbleed sits, it will act upon the same uh, system, increasing inflammation, disrupting metabolism, and ultimately shifting uh, the non-heme iron homeostasis across the cell membrane. Uh, however, we can think of cerebral microbleeds as an indicator of a injury, an acquired injury, whereas the accumulation of non-heme iron that I've reviewed with you today appears to be a cumulative and progressive process across the lifespan. It occurs in all individuals to some degree, and it appears to be a risk factor to predict deficits in function as well as cognitive and behavioral um, cognition and behavior, even in middle-aged and older adults without disease incidence. So to summarize where we've been today, um, we've reviewed the evidence that brain iron accumulation may uh, act as an interesting biomarker to study in the future. Um, there's quite a bit of research that still needs to be done to understand if it is actually acting in a causal way on these mechanisms, or if it is a biomarker in the truest sense, something we can see that signals that a, a process is happening but it does invite an opportunity to study uh, factors that are acting upon it and possible intervention paths. Um, my work now is starting to systematically study this through randomized control trials where we're intervening upon cerebral vascular health and inflammation, as well as uh, in clinical samples following individuals in preclinical cognitive decline like MCI, um, as well as early stages of Alzheimer's disease and seeing if uh, this MRI marker might actually track the progress of these disease states as well. So I appreciate your patience. I know I went a few minutes longer than I expected. Um, I do want to take a moment just to thank um, the many collaborators over the several years that have contributed to these studies, especially the longitudinal ones, as well as my funding sources. I've uh, listed my email here. I'm very happy to take questions or conversations offline after today, uh, but I'm also going to stop talking and, and turn it over to Nathan for the question time. All right, Anna, thank you so very much for this really wonderful and informative talk. Like that was just awesome. Um, I really appreciate the way you walked through that and like seeing a lot of these, um, these mechanisms at work. And it's quite remarkable, I think with MRI, how we can really get that mechanistic view of even cellular function in the living human brain. Um, so, okay, at this time, I'd just like to open this up and invite anyone who has any questions for Anna to go ahead and type them in. All right. Um, Alfie Wern asks you, how specific is T2 star to iron? Are there other factors which could be affecting it? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, 
first of all, no MRI indice is specific to non-heme iron. It is iron broadly defined. And so when I made this distinction between non-heme and heme iron, um, it takes some careful maneuvering of how we sample the data to make sure we don't even have blood vessels in the signal and other things. But of course, these are living brains, so there's a little bit of heme iron in the process as well. But with that said, um, these techniques have been validated against um, phantom studies and histochemical work and animal studies and so on, and really have shown that it is um, non-heme iron bound to ferritin that is at sufficient concentrations to be detected. So first of all, it's not specific, but the majority of the signal appears to be coming from non-heme iron sources. The second point that you make though is that, is there, are there other things that are of sufficient concentration to affect the signal? And T2 star is one of the longest standing methods. It's been the most validated and studied, but it's also the least specific. Uh, things like myelin and water from CSF and other factors also contribute to this signal. And so T2 star is only valid as an estimate of iron in subcortical regions with few or no myelinated fibers. With that said, there is absolutely a role for iron in myelin maintenance. In fact, that's probably where the majority of iron in the brain is going at any given moment. And so other methods like quantitative susceptibility mapping are more specific and sensitive to iron and also are not vulnerable to that same bias. So um, there's a lot of review papers out there. I'd be happy to direct them um, your way, but there's essentially five, five major methods of measuring iron. They all have limitations and, and you know, strengths. And so when we're trying to pick our best tool, it really comes down to the question and the regions that we're trying to study. All right, great, thank you. So Julian Doyon asked, are there any use for 7T compared to 3T for measuring iron? Yeah, so the signal from iron should only be stronger at 70. It is proportional to field, uh, magnetic field. And in fact, some of the data um, that I showed you were collected on 1.5 T, others 3 T, and still others 4 T. And so um, we can modulate the sequence to actually be pretty effective even at lower fields that are more common in clinical practice. With that said, 7T also affords better spatial resolution options. And so when we do want to try to talk about um, you know, smaller cortical regions, or even trying to exclude specific white matter structures from estimation, 7T is probably the next bold frontier that we're all looking to uh, head towards. All right, great. So we have another question. Um, several neurodegenerative diseases show iron accumulation as well as mitochondria dysfunction, and some of them even show impairments in the same cognitive domains. Do you think that iron accumulation could be the common cause to similar cognitive deficits, even in different neurologic disorders? So if yes, how much does iron accumulation contribute to cognitive impairments compared to other neuropathologies? Yeah, this is the million dollar question. Um, and what you just described is probably my lifetime of work and many others after me. Um, I, I think that iron homeostasis is such a fundamental process uh, that it is co-opted by many things. It's co-opted by just having a cold for a few days. So it, I think it's a little bit um, premature to suggest that it's specific to any singular pathology. However, as you articulated, there are so many neurodegenerative diseases that appear to have common symptoms and even symptom profiles. And so what we've seen is that I've shown you mostly evidence today from typical what we would term typical healthy or successful aging. Uh, there's also longitudinal studies now showing iron accumulation and multiple sclerosis. There's a large literature in Parkinson's disease. Um, to my knowledge, there are no longitudinal studies tracking Alzheimer's disease incidence, but there are some um, studies showing that it does track symptom severity that is similar to dementia. Um, but there's an entire class of neurodegenerative diseases that are specifically defined by abnormal iron accumulation. These are the MBIA, neurodegenerative brain iron accumulation. Um, some are genetic, the PCAN diseases, hemochromatosis, and others. So um, I think what we're studying is probably a common neurodegenerative mechanism, and it will just play out differently. Where you will see specificity, though, is the vulnerability of specific brain regions to the mechanism. That is, mitochondrial dysfunction might be the same but mitochondrial dysfunction in the hippocampus will produce dementia-like features. Mitochondrial dysfunction in the red nucleus substantia nigra and dentate nucleus cerebellum will give you motor disorder issues. Um, in frontal regions, frontal temporal dementia and uh, executive dysfunction. And so I think where we 
don't have specificity in the mechanism, we probably see specificity in the risk profile and the locations of, in the brain that it does play out. Great. All right, so you've shown that some people's brain iron goes down with time. Uh, what are some of the factors that could help to lower brain iron? I, okay, second million dollar question. Um, <laughs> uh, so what we can expect is that like any metabolic process, there are going to be ebbs and flows. And then we also factor in just normal measurement error. So when I see that someone goes down, I don't know, you know, neither one value is perfectly accurate. But to the extent that we think that this may be predictive, and to the extent that we think that maybe lowering it either directly or indirectly lowers risk, um, there's a few candidates that I'm interested in. And that's why I study cerebrovascular health. So lifestyle factors like exercise, nutrition, um, seem to be acting upon the same system. And so I am really one of the few that are really trying to characterize these lifestyle factors that may act upon it, as well as inflammation and, and different routes of modulating inflammation. Um, there are, of course, many pharmaceuticals that are currently being targeted specifically for iron sequestration um, for any number of the diseases that we've already been talking about today. What's been an interesting challenge is that um, many of these pharmaceuticals um, do not cross the human blood-brain barrier. Um, when we see iron accumulation in other diseases like hemochromatosis and MBIA, it usually is accompanied by iron accumulation in the peripheral organs. And in fact, most of those individuals actually die from heart, um, cardiovascular disease, heart conditions, as well as cirrhosis of the liver. Um, and so these drugs are very successful in binding and mitigating iron accumulation in the peripheral organ system. But there's been a, quite a bit of research now that shows that the brain has a privileged access to uh, iron stores throughout the whole body. And that even if we mitigate peripheral levels, the rate of iron accumulation across the blood-brain barrier stays the same. And that certain regions appear to accumulate it more than others. So the jury is still out about how to do these targeted effects within the brain. Um, I'm going the lifestyle route. You could talk to so many others who are trying to do targeted pharmaceutical work. All right, great. So. Um... Dave Rucco said, beautiful talk and very interesting work. He's intrigued by the amyloid SUVR versus the R2 star relationships and asked, is amyloid accumulation preceding iron accumulation or vice versa? And could inflammation in the basal ganglia alter the age-related R2 star changes we see in, quote, healthy aging? Yeah. Um, so you're really kind of asking two separate but related questions, two things that converge. Let me take the SUVR first. So what we found, at least in that sample, of selectively healthy, optimal healthy older adults um, who are also all cognitive typical, that individuals who are amyloid positive, who have high SUVR, weakly also have high iron, but it's not a strong correlation. It's not a strong correlation, by the way, if we look at it whole brain or region by region. Um, other animal models of amyloidopathy, as well as um, histochemical work, have really shown that the beta amyloid conformation attracts iron outside of the cell and fundamentally shifts iron homeostasis. It's also been shown that iron disruption to metabolic pathways and increasing oxidative stress and inflammation in turn promotes beta amyloid production. So what we're probably looking at mechanistically is a bi-directional relationship. As far as what MRI can tell us from biomarkers, what we are probably seeing are two distant biomarkers that are correlated to common causes. And so for them to be weakly correlated in an otherwise healthy sample was not terribly surprising. But what we, the takeaway of that study was that two biomarkers of aging-related pathology are interacting to signal vulnerability to Alzheimer's disease as indicated by smaller interrenal cortex volume. So that was a very exciting finding that was entirely consistent with how we might think about this mechanistically. The question about inflammation. I, I think inflammation absolutely does act upon this pathway. Um, it, it, again, inflammation has a bi-directional relation with iron homeostasis. More iron promotes inflammation. More inflammation promotes more iron. It just keeps going back and forth. That's how the system is designed to work. Um, we can imagine that certain structures like the striatum that are vulnerable to inflammation and vulnerable to age-related iron accumulation might be particularly vulnerable to that mechanism I just described. 
but as well as medial temporal um, lobe regions like the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus, as well as prefrontal cortex regions, insular cortex, and so on. Essentially the heavy hitters that we study in aging because they are vulnerable to these systemic factors. So I say jury's still out, follow me for 10 more years, hopefully I'll have a, a better answer for you. All right, great. So we have another question. Um, let's see. So I wonder if you can speak to the subregion specificity for iron accumulation and how it affects the relationships between iron and cognition. So I'm thinking of the 2013 Rodrigue paper, which showed iron in anterior head of hippocampus versus the longitudinal study uh, in tail of hippocampus. So then does the subregion matter uh, potentially for the caudate less so? So if you could just speak to these, like, you know, the subregions of these subcortical structures and their relationship to cognition. Yeah, so um, first of all, like the, the accumulation of iron um, in the anterior hippocampus versus posterior hippocampus, that's just where can we reliably measure signal from the hippocampus. Um, I don't think that there is a good hypothesis for anterior versus posterior hippocampus. Um, differences within the hippocampus. There are region by region differences, caudate nucleus versus hippocampus. Globus pallidus has the highest iron concentration but doesn't appear to accumulate iron the same way. So it has very high loads to begin with but doesn't appear to accumulate it. So there are different factors here. The hippocampus has relatively low iron concentration across the lifespan. It's understudied. Very few labs and studies um, include hippocampal measures probably because we focus on the big ones that have a lot of iron, like basal ganglia and thalamus. And so the question about vulnerability within the, hip, within the longitudinal ap, uh, axis of the hippocampus is, is hard to say. With that said though, there is a single paper about subfields that really does suggest that the, the presentation and loading of iron concentration probably varies between subfields of the hippocampus. So in the medial lateral axis, instead of um, anterior posterior. And within that then it, it seems to track probably the type of cells and density of cells and so on and so it's not surprising that the cortex and around the cortex and subiculum appear to have more iron as compared to the CA3 uh, region um, and CA1 region but the dentate gyrus that has um, th those very dense cells and a little bit of neuromelanin does also appear to um, accumulate iron. So Again, I think stay tuned. Part of this is a limitation of our imaging methods that we haven't had sufficient resolution to ask these questions well, um, but the technology is now catching up with us. So um, I'm actually collecting data right now to try to answer the question about subregions of the hippocampus um, to be vulnerable to this. All right, great. So I had a question. Um, I'm wondering, like, given some of this work that you've shown, if it's attracted some attentions of some you know, large scale data consortiums like Alzheimer's disease and imaging initiative, and if there's more interest in collecting iron imaging um, you know, at a larger scale. And then as a you know, secondary to that, what kind, you know, given that you know, we're all stressed for time in the scanner um, and every minute is pretty precious, what kind of iron imaging would you recommend people do if they are going to include it in their studies? Yeah, these are two really great questions. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't large consortiums that are systematically including a sequence specifically tailored to measure iron. Um, so for example, the ADNI-3 protocol does not have something. They do, of course, collect data that can be processed on the back end um, to estimate T2 star. Um, essentially, any gradient recall echo or epi sequence has a T2 star signal in it. It's buried in it. It's not optimized for studying iron within tissue. And so all of those limitations we were discussing only become worse if you have a sequence that isn't optimized for it. Um, with that said, though, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here in Michigan, I'm a part of the collaborative group there. And from the beginning, we've been collecting some of these sequences. So um, a, a small branch of the NIH funded Alzheimer's Disease Centers are trying to collect some of this data. And if you feel inspired, tell your friends, let's try to get more data. You asked a really great question, though. What's the biggest bang for your buck? Um, if you are a researcher who is interested in adding some hypotheses but don't want to run an entire study about iron, what can you do? Um, the data I showed you today are all coming from multi-echo sequences. The reason why I favor multi-echo sequences is because it gives me a lot of different post-processing options to really pull out the best quality data, um, even in, in the presence of motion and, and low SNR and other things. 
With that said, though, the technology now, even on 3T um, imaging environments, you can do single echo sequences. And as long as you've also acquired the phase data, you can estimate single echo quantitative susceptibility mapping. And as far as biggest bang for your buck, that's the one. Um, you want to invest in a protocol. It'll take um, two to four minutes, depending on your resolution and, and plane of acquisition, and you can uh, estimate QSM or phase-based estimates of iron. You can't calculate T2 star or R2 star, um, but you have better sensitivity and specificity anyways with the QSM method. So um, I'm always really happy to consult on parameters and to share my experiences across different imaging environments. Um, it, it's not quite one size fits all across manufacturers. I will also say that if you are working with a Siemens magnet, they have instituted protocols um, now that are standard packages. There are pros and cons of those standard packages that I'm always happy to talk about. Um, but it comes down to essentially post acquisition filtering. And there is a whole other three hour conversation about filtering options uh, and, and how to optimize for that. All right. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us today. This is really illuminating and a wonderful talk. Um, it was tremendously enjoyed by everyone. There's a nice feed of positive comments. I'm sorry we can't give you a round of applause over Zoom, but it's certainly been earned. Um, and thank you again so much for your time and participation. I look forward to talking to you more offline um, about your work. So yeah, again, absolutely. Thank you again all for your attention and, and for sticking around for the very end. Bye.